practice by most anyone. Furthermore, when you think about the age we live in, we're able to see centuries of research uh, on particular subjects brought together and compiled and, 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 and placed uh, digitally where anybody that uh, is an expert, the, 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 the smart guys of our society can, can click and have all that research available to them in a very short term and, and uh, a short time. And we have sophisticated uh, instruments and advanced understanding and modern techniques and all of these things that I've spoken of accelerate the progress that's being made in particular fields. It, it accelerates it in, in great multiples. You look at genetic research and forensics and DNA, it's, it's like all of this is just like a big ball that's rolling down a steep hill. The further it goes, the faster it goes, and more information, and more information, and, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's very, really, in a lot of ways, it's scary. Uh, when you think about the artificial intelligence and, and these sort of things, but then in also in other ways, it, it's exciting, uh, especially it, it, to our benefit in the medical field. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, heart issues or, or whatever, they can do things that they've never done before, and they can, they can whittle, they can take you in and whittle on your heart and, uh, and sew you up and send you home in a couple of days, and you'll be just fine. And so those things are to our advantage. With that being said, we're in Psalms chapter 19. I want you to read the first verse with me. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. King David, or, or rather David, uh, uh, speaks here, uh, and he's, his, the particular subject that he's speaking of is astronomy. We know that. Astronomy in the Greek uh, simply means study of the stars. In ancient times, it was all done with the naked eye, and so the stars were the extent of the study. But in time, uh, we know that uh, astronomy has, has, has uh, expanded to the point that it's dealing with all celestial uh, objects, uh, uh, the planets, the moons, the stars, nebulae, comets, meteors, all of these things, and mathematics has become part of it, and physics, and, and uh, uh, chemistry, and all these things are involved. Just another example, if you will, of the rapid advancement. They can measure uh, uh, distances uh, that are unbelievable. They can, they can uh, know the density and the size of particular planets and, and the, the orbits and the speed of travel and all of these things. And David didn't know any of these things when he wrote this psalm. All he knew was what he was seeing in the sky displayed the glory of God. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Firmament, just simply, that word just is speaking of the visible sky when you look up. David is simply saying, what I see above me is like a masterpiece that God has painted and it's, and it's framed by the horizons. David is saying, I just see the big, glorious picture that God has painted. He was astonished at what he saw. He knew that only God could put something like that together. And so he spends the next five verses. We're not going to take time to, uh, uh, to read down through verse 6. But he spends those talking about the glory of the universe and how it had spoken to his heart. But I want you to notice one thing he says in verse 3. He says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In other words, he's saying the stars that I'm looking at, there's not a, there's, there, there's not a, 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 dial, a dialect or, or, or a, a race or nation or place or anything that cannot see this, okay? In other words, it's universal. Uh, uh, no matter what nation you reside in or what language you speak, the masterpiece is always on display to all people. That's simply what he's saying. Now, was David young, and uh, was he a shepherd boy when he wrote this? I'm not sure. He very well could have been, but he possibly could have been when he was the king, and he might have been staring out the palace window and seeing these things. We, we don't really know when he wrote the psalm, but what we do know is he had the glory of God in mind as he looked into the sky. And so, for six verses there, he speaks of that glory. And then suddenly, 
David makes a very drastic shift. And I want you to notice as we go to verse 7. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Do you see what David has done here? He goes from talking about the, the heavens and all of their glory to speaking of the Word of God and all its glory. It's almost like David is saying, yes, you can, uh, the, 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 the universe will point you to God, but you really have to go to His Word if you want to know Him. It's almost like he's saying, uh, the, the, the stars will tell you something about God. It tells of His power and His order and his, all of his, his, the extent of His capabilities, but the Word of God will introduce you to Him personally. The Word of God speaks of His nature and His character and His personality. It shows you a God who cares, a God who feels, a God who loves, a God who wants to be involved with your life. And then as you read the Word of God, it invites you into a relationship with God, and it begins to show you, Old Testament or New, how you can be right with God and be in a relationship. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if you want to grow in faith, and I think you all do, and I do as well, then the Word of God is where we need to spend our time. You know, the information age, be what it may, really doesn't offer any more about God than what was offered to the first disciples 2,000 years ago. God's Word doesn't increase and it doesn't decrease. There's not more of it or less of it as generation to generation goes by. So for the next few minutes, I want to share with you some of the benefits of God's Word in a believer's life. Now, in these verses, David speaks of the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. And each of those terms are really synonymous with the word of the Lord, okay? And so it's simply speaking of God's word. And so that's how I will uh, phrase each of these points that I make. And it, I'll, I'll be brief. There's six of them, but, but I'll be very brief. The first one is this. The Word of God is perfect. Notice verse 7. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The word perfect simply means that it's complete and it's sufficient. What it's saying is, is God's Word is enough. It's comprehensive. It covers all aspects of your life. It lacks nothing. In other words, it's saying that the Bible is sufficient to guide you through your life. It's all you have to have. It's the answers that you need. And folks, I'm for education. I'm for training in particular fields. We want doctors to go to school, don't we? And we, we want teachers to go to school. We understand that. I'm for uh, 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 counseling. If a person is having difficult time in life and, and is having troubles, I'm, I'm for counseling. I'm for research. I'm for discovery. I'm for advancement in knowledge. I, I'm even for YouTube, if you will. I love YouTube, okay? YouTube has helped me work through more than one problem in life, from changing my wife's brakes to changing my wife's attitude. Um, <laughs> I challenge you, fellas, go do a search on YouTube, How to Change My Wife's Attitude. I'll tell you what it pulls up. Nothing. <laughs> there, there are no answers. <laughs> okay. There are no answers. But I'm for YouTube. But, but, and by the way, there's marriage counseling on YouTube as well. So, uh, uh, YouTube can't fix everything, right? The Internet can't fix everything. Education doesn't have all the answers. Time and experience can help us gain a lot of knowledge, but not all of it. Nothing can teach us like the Word of God. It says in verse 7 that it converts the soul, simply meaning that it transforms our inner being. God's Word is complete. It's sufficient to change who we are on the inside is simply what it's saying. Friends, you can't learn how to love in a classroom. 
You can't learn or, or the uh, internet can't give you the eternal hope that you're looking for. YouTube can't teach you how to forgive. But the Bible can, and it transforms us from the inside out if we will let it, if we'll expose ourselves to it. I have a family member who I love dearly, but they don't know Jesus, and they don't accept the Bible as God's Word, and so I'm very limited in my ability to witness to them about God's redeeming love because when you take the Bible out of the equation, you're just so limited. But one thing that I know that I have that's visible and cannot be denied. And that's the change that has come into my life and my wife's life uh, since we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ many years ago. It's, it's a, uh, we were converted, if you will, in our souls the moment that we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But what began out there at that point was a transformation, just as it did in your life, a changing of our hearts. And that's something that has manifested itself over a 34-year 30 year period, okay? We're not where we need to be, but we're a long ways from where we used to be. And I say all that to say this. I hope that that testimony to that particular person is, uh, it might be effective. I've hoped and I've prayed that when you, uh, I can't tell them about Jesus particularly because they won't even accept the Word of God, that maybe because they've watched it our lives for many years now, they've watched our children come up, they've watched uh, what's happened with, uh, with, with us, and, and I'm hoping that, that ha they can't explain that except one thing. God changes hearts. And so I hope they'll realize that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, the new that it's talking about there simply comes from the transforming power of God's Word. Let's move on to the next one. The Word of God doesn't change. Notice the second part of verse 7. It says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Sure means it's just simply faithful and trustworthy. You know, we don't have to worry about the truths of God's Word changing on us. We don't have to worry about it evolving and beginning to adapt to the times. Because it never changes. Everything around us, friends... Is changing from day to day. I tell my kids, I, they, they think I make stuff up, but, but I don't. I've got some real life experience that, that I share with them about when we were growing up and, and how we used to do things, and it just blows their mind. I tell them how we used to, when we were kids, we'd ride, with our, uh, we'd ride on the tailgate to town uh, with our legs hanging off. Uh, 55 miles an hour, boy, that was fast back then, but that's what the speed limit was. And, and Grandpa would take us to town, 19 miles to Clarendon, with us sitting on the tailgate, cars passing us, and, and nobody ever said anything. That's just the way it was. It's hard. That's a, quite a change, is it not? you got to wear a seat belt and a helmet and have airbags surrounding you and everything else to travel today. But it all changed. I tell them about how things were in school, I, I, how we had... Uh, hunting rifles and shotguns on a rack in the back window of our pickup parked in the parking lot at the school with the doors unlocked. And they're like, what? <laughs> I tell them how we had a pocket knife in the front pocket and snuff in the back and nobody said anything about it right there in school. I tell them about how they whipped us at school. <laughs> Folks, I don't understand. I look back on that and I, it's bizarre to me. The teacher would whoop you, the coach would whoop you, the principal would whoop you, and the janitor might get him some. <laughs> they just beat us all around the schoolhouse. We just go up there and just get whipped. My kids can't understand that. It's quite a change, is it not? Everything around us is changing. But God's Word never changes. It never changes. And it says that in that verse that making wise the simple. The unchanging Word of God levels the playing field. The brilliant, enlightened, advanced minds of today don't have any more of God's truth 
than the simple minds of generations a thousand years ago. See, God's Word. You can know just as much about God as the smartest guy on the planet. It makes wise the simple. God's Word is straightforward. Notice verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Don't you wish people would just be more straightforward? Don't you wish we would just learn to quit mincing words and, and say the truth and, and call it like it is once in a while? And black is black. It doesn't have to be gray. White is white. It doesn't have to be gray. One plus one equals two. It's, 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 it's a fact. Wrong is wrong and right is right. Just call it, friends. Be straightforward. Quit monkeying around. We don't have to be brutal about the truths, but we should be truthful. We've got to stop blurring the lines. And, and for heaven's sake, we're not going to make everyone happy, okay? You can't please the world around you, but the text says here that it will rejoice our hearts. If we will simply, as individuals, remove all the confusion, all the mincing words, and just say, Thus saith the Lord. Then we don't have to hem haw around and vacillate between uh, opinions. God lays it out very straight. He's straightforward. Accept it as it is and call it what it is. That leads me to the next half of verse 8. <clears throat> it says, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You know, God's word purifies us. If a person was to grow up in today's world without any exposure to the church or without any exposure to, uh, 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 to God's word, and perhaps maybe being raised, if they were raised in a family that had no Christian connections or Christian values or Judeo-Christian values, there would be a lot of things, and folks, this is what's happening. There would be a lot of things that they would think were okay, but in the eyes of God, they're not okay. We see it all around us. Especially in the area of sexual expression. And the result of this is we see more and more confusion, dysfunction, and broken lives. Because people think certain things are okay when they're not okay. You see, that's what our society is doing. Let me give you a, a, an instance. There's a commercial that comes on the TV. Oh, just commercials are driving me nuts these days. They celebrate everything but what's right. But this commercial comes on advertising help. Uh, a medication that will help in managing HIV, a medication that will ease the symptoms of HIV. And folks, believe me, I'm for that. Any person that's ill for, under, with any circumstance, I'm for helping them, okay? I'm for that sort of thing. But here's what you see. What they show in the commercial as they're passing this information on about HIV and, and, and coping with its symptoms is they show homosexual couples. Now, when you think about this, I do think a lot. What does that tell the young person that's watching this commercial? It tells them that, hey, men with men and women with women, boys with boys and girls with girls is okay, but it might result in HIV. And if it does, here's how you're going to deal with it. You see what the message is? Why not have a commercial that says, Here's the leading cause of HIV. This is not, this is what you don't want to do. This is the sort of thing that leads to a life-threatening disease. So you want to steer clear of it. That's not going to happen, folks. But what can happen and what does happen when we read God's Word, it's so straightforward. It enlightens us and it helps us to know what's right and what's wrong. If you ever question the importance of church, ask yourself, how am I going to show my kids right and wrong? Sure, you can instruct them, and that's very good, and that's where most of it's going to happen. But if you use the Word of God as the basis of that instruction, 
you're going to make an impact on your child's life or your grandchild's life that will carry them into eternity, okay? It leads to the next one, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. God's Word leads to a very healthy respect for the Lord. That's what the fear of the Lord is. It's a reverence or a respect for God. You know, I like to think that I do a lot of things uh, right because I love the Lord. But the truth of the matter is, is I do, I avoid a lot of things that are wrong because I fear God. I just simply, I, I, I fear God. I don't want Him to have to use His hand of correction in my life. I don't want Him to exercise His fatherly uh, chastisement upon Him. I've had it before. I don't like it. Uh, and, and so consequently, I want to try to avoid things that are wrong. Yes, because I love Him, absolutely. But also because I fear Him. You know, when we were growing up, we didn't have what they call time out for children, did we? You know, we had, we had time outside cutting a switch off a tree, okay? And when that was aggressively applied to our backside, it gave us a healthy fear of our parents and our grandparents, right? You have that a time or two, and you have a respect for mom and dad. You have a respect for grandma and grandpa. It develops a healthy fear of those that are in charge of our life. Well, see, God's the same way. You get his hand of a chastisement and correction a time or two, and you'll learn to fear the Lord. It leads to the very last one, and I'm done. Second part of verse 9 says this, The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Simply put, God's Word stands as the judge in our life. The, the, the word judgment obviously has a judicial sense to it. The bottom line is this, what it's saying. Whatever God says is the final word. We're not going to be judged by our friends and our contemporaries. The world's opinions won't make any difference in the end. The laws of the land, the trends of the land, the standards of the land uh, will have no bearing when we stand before God. It will simply be, what did God say and what did I do with it? That's what's going to matter. He's the judge. His word is the judge. It's going to boil down to, did I listen to what he said and respond in the appropriate way? Friends, don't underestimate the importance of the Word of God. David says, oh, I see God's handiwork when I look in the sky. This big framed masterpiece is something else, and it really shows me the glory of God, but His Word is what helps me know Him. You need the Word of God in your life. It's perfect it doesn't change. It's straightforward. It purifies you. It'll give you a healthy fear of God. And it will stand as your judge. Brother David, if you'll come. Maybe you're here this morning. and It's, it's, it's early in the year, folks. It's not too late to start a system of reading God's Word for this next year. Whether it be the New Testament or the whole Bible. Just say, you know what? I need a plan. I want to read the Word of God. That's my New Year's resolution. A couple of weeks late, yeah, I understand that. But I want God's Word to impact my life this year. You read it, it's going to impact you, folks. I'm going to ask you to stand. Maybe God spoke into your heart. Maybe you want to make a commitment to the Word of God. Maybe you want to come forward and deal with some other issue. Whatever it is, God spoke into your heart. These altars are open. Heads bowed, eyes closed.